Good morning. Please state and spell your name for us. Christina, C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A, Figueroa, F-I-G-U-E-R-O-A, Soto, S-O-T-O. And uh, what do you do for a living, doctor? Um, I work for the Dane County Medical Examiner as their forensic anthropologist and chief of investigations. Sure. I'm showing you what's been marked in this case is exhibit number 371. Let me briefly identify what that is. This is my curriculum vitae. All right, I'll move 371 into evidence. No objection. It is received, and I'll ask the witness to slide the microphone a lot oh, yeah. closer because the, the blowers have turned on and they create a good deal of noise in the Is this better? Okay. Thank you. Uh, doctor, do you hold any post-graduate degrees? I do. Could you please uh, talk about those? Sure. So I have a master's uh, in forensic anthropology at Texas State University. Um, at that university, they do have um, one of the largest um, decomposition research facilities in the country, or what we usually call a body farm. Um, I also hold a PhD, again, in forensic anthropology from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, this is the university where you could consider the pioneer of forensic anthropology, again, with another body farm um, in place. Sure. Uh, as part of your, your work and your postgraduate degrees, I imagine there's a good deal of, of academic study in the classroom, but also a good deal of practical study in the field? It is correct, and, yes. And you use the phrase body farms. Could you tell us, essentially in your profession as an anthropologist, how does one learn to do the work uh, practically that they have to do uh, in their career? Sure. So pretty much, um, we focus on three things. One is the search and recovery of um, human remains. So that's where um, the body farm comes into place, right? So the can learn how to search for, recover the remains, and then once the remains are located, um, pretty much that's where the second thing comes in, which is the analysis, right? So one of the main things that we are focused on doing is trying to identify human remains, right, whenever they're unidentified. So um, at the facility, once the individuals are uh, pretty much um, done with decomposition, the skeleton itself is a valuable um, part of the research, right, in order for us to um, create new methods for identification, right? So whenever we have unknown human remains, we can actually estimate the age of the individual, the stature, um, the biological sex of the individual, as well as the ancestral background, or what we usually call race. Um, usually, once we get that profile or that information from the bones, we can usually give that to law enforcement or the medical examiner in order to narrow it down and help with identification. The third thing that we do is focusing on trauma analysis, right? Once we search, once we recover, once we identified, then we look for trauma. Our main goal is to A, identify the type of trauma that it is. Second, to locate. Where is the trauma located in the body? And third, mostly um, trying to figure it out how that trauma had something to do with the cause and the manner of death. So those are kind of a summary of the three things that we do and how the facility actually helps us um, getting that training. Sure, and when we talk about human remains and, and the practical part of your education and, and getting your master's and your PhD, are these actual human remains that you're studying? Yes, so uh, both skeletal collections and both um, research facilities, they're donated human, they're donated remains. So individuals, once they're alive, they decided to donate their bodies to science, or usually the next of kin can actually donate their bodies to science as well. Uh, after receiving your PhD in biological anthropology, um, um, could you just talk through what your career progression has been, where you've worked and what you've done? Sure. So um, once um, I was almost done with my PhD, I actually started a position at the Waukesha County Medical Examiner's Office. I was in a dual position as their forensic anthropologist, as well as their deputy medical examiner. So there I spent about five, or oh, a little bit over five years. And then after that, I was um, hired here at the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office as their um, chief of investigations and also forensic anthropologist as well. I, aside from this case, what types of uh, deaths or crime scenes uh, are you often called upon to work on? So, um, especially in Waukesha and also here, I had experience um, with motor vehicle accidents, um, motor vehicle accidents that engulf in flames, um, all the way to gunshot wounds to the head, gunshot wounds to the torso, um, 
pretty much search and recovery of remains as well. Um, and that can be categorized into a very secluded area, right, where the remains are undisturbed, all the way to areas where the remains have been disturbed. That could be from animal activity all the way to, obviously, human activity, right? In those regards, it's usually maybe because of a motor vehicle accident or because of fire trauma. Um, so pretty much... I would say from, you know, from all the spectrum to search and recovery to um, multiple, um, multiple cases of, of trauma as well. Sure. You're not a medical doctor, correct? I am not. Uh, we've heard from multiple medical examiners, Dr. Rogalska uh, and Dr. Breslauer in this case. Could you explain how your job as a forensic anthropologist is different from their job uh, as, a, as a, a, a forensic pathologist, essentially? Sure. So I always look at it as I work with the hard tissue, and the pathologist focuses on the soft tissue, right? So I focus on the bone itself, right? But the soft tissue is very important to me, right? So that's why I have to work along with the pathologist, right? Because just to give you an example, if I see a bone still during autopsy and I see a potential uh, fracture, I always like to look at the tissue because there might be hemorrhage there, right? So we kind of need to work together. I do not establish cause and manner of death. I actually provide information so that the pathologist can actually put it together and from my information get an estimated, you know, guess about the cause and manner of death. So my focus is on the bone itself, right? And we go back again to the identification process and the trauma analysis. How that information is actually going to help the pathologist determine who this person is, and then from there also determine and help with the cause and the manner of death. Uh, since graduating and, and beginning your career as an anthropologist, are you ever called upon to teach or instruct law enforcement and other professionals, both at a state and national level, uh, about what you do and, and the uh, concept of forensic anthropology in general? Yes. So I actually started that during my graduate career. So part of my graduate career involves teaching. So, um, and especially at Texas State and also the University of Knoxville, the Tennessee and Knoxville, because those facilities are actually used for training. So um, since my master career, my master uh, program, I had to teach um, from search and recovery all the way to identification and trauma analysis to local law enforcement and to the FBI. The same with Tennessee. We have a program there where law enforcement from all over the country usually comes here for training. Uh, the same with the FBI as well. And also here in Wisconsin, I've been um, able to teach and train some of the local law enforcement in regards to search and recovery as well as um, the identification process um, when we have unknown human remains. Uh, doctor, were you asked to become involved uh, into the investigation of the homicides of Bart and Krista Halderson, um, and, and as well as obviously some remains or bone fragments found uh, at the home uh, on Oak Springs in the town of Windsor? I was. And uh, you performed uh, quite a bit of work in this case, did you not? I did. Um, you have written four separate reports. I did. Uh, one involving Bart Halderson. That's correct. One involving Krista. That's correct. One involving the remains found near Krista that hadn't been DNA uh, determined to be Krista, correct? That's correct. And then lastly, one regarding items found at the home on Oak Springs. That is correct. Okay. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number uh, 569. Is this a printout of the presentation that we've developed uh, to try to present some of your testimony here today? That is correct. And 379 is just a USB containing that presentation? That is correct. All right. I'll move 569 and 7, or 379, and move to display seven, 379. No objection. They are received. Every case presents different questions uh, for people at the medical examiner's office, and specifically for you. Every case presents different questions you're trying to answer. Correct? That's correct, yes. And even today, uh, as we go through the different sets of remains, at different times, you're trying to answer different questions. Yes. All right. Um, we're going to start uh, with Bart Halderson. Uh, for the record, I'm showing you it's been marked as Exhibit 375. Is that your report related to Mr. Halderson? That is correct. Okay. I'll move 375 into evidence. No objection. It is received. It may be published. When it comes to Bart Halderson, you weren't necessarily trying to identify who he was. That was established already, correct? Yes, that is correct. What questions were you trying to answer when it comes to Bart Halderson? 
So in this case, um, the main question was because there was trauma. There was sharp force trauma to the bone. So in the setting of a dismember, a potential dismemberment, um, the goal of this examination was to try to determine or trying to provide information about the type of the class characteristics of the tools that were potentially used for the dismemberment. Sure. So if we go to the first slide, it talks about the beginning of your involvement. Just tell me how you became involved in the study of Mr. Bart Alderson's uh, dismemberment. Sure. So pretty much uh, once the autopsy was completed um, and the individual was positively identified, um, again, due to the presence of sharp force trauma, um, I was in the setting of a potential dismemberment. Um, I was called in order to examine uh, the human remains, again, because of the trauma analysis and the potential um, um, the potential goal for getting an anthropological tool mark analysis um, that can provide information about the classifications or the properties of the tools uh, that were potentially used in this setting. When you use the phrase anthropological tool mark analysis, um, what do you mean by that? What are you trying to determine? Sure. So an anthropological tool mark analysis focuses on the characteristics, right? So I'm looking at the characteristics that were left on the bone and how those characteristics actually are similar or dissimilar to any other tool or potential characteristics of other tools that were found near the decedent or anything that is of potential evidence. Could you tell me a little bit about the general condition of the remains uh, when you uh, had access to them? Sure. Um, specifically for uh, the decedent, um, there was a lot of changes, um, especially on the torso. Um, there was marbling, there was skin slippage, um, there was maggot activity. Um, so pretty much once the autopsy was completed, um, Dr. Corey Breslauer was the one who actually mass um, dissected the elements that were needed for analysis. Once the elements were dissected, um, the elements were macerated in water, which is just pretty much cleaning in water. And then after that, they were dried for about two weeks. Um, the elements that were removed from the body um, that had dismemberment trauma were pretty much um, both arms and uh, both femur or the legs. Sure. Uh when the last bullet point there, you say each element was macerated in water and air dried. Um, throughout this presentation, um, the jury's looked at a lot of photographs in this case. We're not going to look at any photographs of, of the body being decomposed or anything of that sort, correct? We're going to look at That bones. is correct, yes. Um, there are photographs of bones, and these are, in fact, um, the bones of Bart Halderson we're going to look at. That is correct. Okay. Um, after you were able to um, take a look at those bones, you performed something called a skeletal inventory. That is correct. What is a skeletal inventory? So pretty much for me, I just need to know what I have, right? So in order for me to start my examination, I want to look for features, and I, A, want to make sure that I have one single individual, and B, that all the elements that I'm looking for, that I need for the analysis, are present. Sure. So we'll start here. Um, and just to clarify, those are, in fact, Mr. Halderson's bones we're looking at? Yes. Okay. And we have a, an example, obviously, a skeleton on the right showing us the location, but tell the jury what we're looking at here. Sure. So right now we're looking at the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh cervical vertebrae. So cervical vertebrae is pretty much what makes your neck, right? So that is the reason why I put that in there, so that you guys can get an idea of what section we're looking at. Um, like I said, it's for all the way from the fourth, all the way to the seventh. Below the seventh, that's when your thoracic vertebrae starts. So it's pretty much almost at the bottom of the neck. In counting the vertebrae, we start at the top with one, and then mm -hmm. we go down, uh, correct? So the fourth there is the highest one? Yeah, so pretty much we have the skull, and then from the skull we have one, two, and three, and then from three all the way to seven, that's what makes up your neck. And are these the only vertebrae, are these the top vertebrae that you were able to obtain from the torso? Yes, those are the only cervical vertebrae that were available. What are we looking at here? So that's pretty much your arm, so it's the humerus. So we have the left humerus, and what I did is I show you different views, right? The front, the back, the side, the inside, and then we also had the right humerus. And again, I provided you with multiple views of it. The humerus is, is just pretty much your arm bone. So it's pretty much from, kind of from the top of your shoulder all the way, almost maybe kind of halfway. Sure. And on the left there is the, the, the left arm, and on the right is the right arm? Yes. Okay. And those are Mr. Halderson's bones? That is correct. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, what are we looking at here? So now we're looking at the femur, or pretty much kind of the top part of the leg. Um, again, we have the left femur, and what I included is different views so that you guys can see the front, the back, and the sides. And then we have the right femur. And again, I show you multiple views so that you guys can have a general overview of the element itself. Sure. Uh, and you were able to make some observations uh, fairly quickly uh, about what was going on, or at least of some suspicions you had of how those limbs were severed? Yes. Okay. So the first thing that I noticed is that there is dismemberment trauma on the skeleton, and it is consistent with transection via sawing. Um, pretty much when I'm doing an anthropological tool mark analysis, I'm trying to focus on several things. One of them is false starts, also the distance between the teeth of whatever tool we're using, and then also the direction of blade, a direction of progress, progress of the blade, and also of the cutting stroke. Sure. And uh, for Mr. Halderson, we're going to go through these in some more detail just to teach everyone about what we're talking about, right? But we're not, sure. we're not going to do that for everybody. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, let's talk about what is a false start. Uh, sure. All right, go ahead. So a false start is just a cut that did not go through, right? That it did not separate the bone completely. Um, the, one of the reasons why I'm very interested in false starts is because it gives me a lot of information. The deeper the false start, the more information I'm gonna get about the tool. One of them is the minimum curve, right? So the curve is just a fancy word for the walls, right? The walls of that false start. Um, so the width, the minimum width of that false start is actually gonna give me information about the width of the set of the blade, right? If you think about it, the knife goes through the bone, so whatever false start I have and whatever width I have is directly correlated with the width of that blade. So that's why it's so important. Again, the deeper it is, the more information I can get. Sure. Uh, and an example I think maybe you and I talked about meeting in December was I, I talked about cutting down my Christmas tree and where I pushed the saw through and it got stuck and I pulled it out. That's a false start. Yes, that is a good example of a false start. Okay. What do we mean when we talk about teeth per inch and why is that important? Sure. So... Um, in regards to teeth per inch, right, if we're thinking about tools and the type of tools that we're utilizing for whatever type of job you have, right, you're always, depending on the, on, on the tool and the job, you always want to look for teeth per inch. So teeth per inch, the, low, the, the smaller the teeth per inch, the rougher the cut is going to be, right, if you're thinking about wood. Um, if you have a higher teeth per inch, that is usually something that is going to give you a smoother cut. So that's just thinking in terms of, right, if you go to the hardware store and, and you're looking for, you know, some type of job. Um, in this case, teeth per inch is actually very informative for us as well because it's a very unique characteristic of the tool itself. And that actually reflects on the bone itself. So as you're cutting through, depending on how many teeth per inch you have, it's gonna create some grooves and some dips in the bone itself. So those dips and those grooves, we can actually measure them and we can correlate that distance is actually correlated again back to the teeth per inch. The measurement of the actual tool itself is very simple. You take the tool, you obviously put a scale, and then you count how many, uh, how many uh, teeth you have within an inch, right? So the same is with the bone. I measure, and then from there, I actually calculate how many teeth per inch I have on that bone. Okay. So we talked about the false starts. So we have a cut that didn't go all the way through. So from that cut, you know the width of the blade. Yes. And if you look inside the cut, you're saying you can see grooves that help you determine approximately teeth per inch. That is correct. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit today about breakaway notches and directions of blade progress. Um, what do we mean by this and, and what is this, this slide telling us? Sure. So whenever you're cutting, right, we have the false start. Whenever we go all the way down, right, so we successfully cut whatever we need in two halves, sometimes we're going to get a breakaway notch or a spur. So a breakaway notch is just simply pretty much a projection of the bone in this case, right? So that projection is actually very important for me because it gives me some information. 
First, it gives me information about the energy or how much force was used, right? So we usually try to say the smaller the breakaway notch or the smaller the, the breakaway spurs, the less energy. And that's usually um, related to potentially a handsaw, right? If we are using something with more energy, right? If we're using a power-driven saw, um, that is gonna give me a bigger breakaway notch, right? So it gives me a little bit of information about the type of energy. Um, from the breakaway notch or the spur, we can also determine the direction. There's two types of directions here, right? And they're both very important. One is the blade progress. That is just simply telling me was the, bun the bone cut from front to back, from back to front. It's just pretty much the direction of the cut, right? The second thing is actually telling me the cutting stroke. So that's telling me, is the knife entering through the side, right, from the side and then ending all the way into the inside of it? So you would think, why is that important? Well, if the knife is entering, entering through the side, that means the handle was on the side, right? So that gives me a little bit of information about position, right? How was that bone cut? So it is very important for me to determine the blade progress and also the cutting stroke because it gives me information about, again, the mechanisms. How did, how did this happen? Okay, so we have... The false starts, the width of the blade, the teeth per inch that you can see inside that false start, and now we're talking about something else, which is when it goes all the way through, what's that spur look like at the end? And you're saying you can gather something from that about the, the type of force used, essentially, uh, in, in cutting through that bone. That is correct. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about is the classification of blades, um, the difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw. Could you talk about that? Sure. So these are kind of the most common ones, right? And when, it, when we're talking about saws. Um, so these are the classifications of the blade. This is also, again, very important because it's very unique to the bone and it gives a very unique feature that we can look at and say, hey, this is more, mostly classified with a rip saw or mostly classified with a cross cut. And because these are so common, um, it is very informative when we're trying to classify and we're trying to find um, information about the potential tool that was used. Um, for rip saws, they're very, they're very unique. I pretty much each tooth kind of chisels um, a bite out of whatever you're trying to cut, right? So in this case, it leaves a very unique mark. It leaves a very flat bottom um, and is almost squared, right? So I'm looking for that on the bone, especially on that breakaway notch, right? So as you're done cutting, that breakaway notch is gonna give me that information so we can look at the bottom and see if the bottom is flat and it looks squared, that is indicative of a rip saw. The opposite will be for a cross cut, right? So we're looking again at that breakaway notch, and we're looking at the end of it, and if I see that it looks almost like a W, that is usually indicative of a cross cut. The reason for that is because the cross cut actually pretty much cuts with the grain, right? So it leaves that mark, a very unique W mark. Uh, so let's start talking about Mr. Halderson, uh, using all of those, those tools in our, our tool belt in terms of what we're looking at. Um, let's talk about the top cervical vertebrae uh, where uh, Mr. Halderson appears to have been uh, beheaded at, at some point. Could you talk about what you were able to observe on that fourth cervical vertebrae? Sure. So um, I only included the fourth cervical vertebrae because that was the only one that actually had dismemberment trauma, right? Um, the four cervical vertebrae, I don't know if you notice on the other photos, it seems like this one is a little bit different. The reason for that is because we're missing the top, right? So if you can see, most of the inside of the bone looks very um, brittle, almost like a sponge. So that is actually the inside of the bone. Inside of that bone, you need almost like a top, like a cap that cap is missing, right? So that tells me that at some point there was some transection or some pretty much dissection or dismemberment of that area. Um, false starts, none were identified. One of the reasons for that is because of the type of bone that we have, right? You're seeing that it's very, it almost looks like a sponge. Those don't record um, the characteristics of the tool very well, right? So usually on more long bones, we will record a better um, characteristics, but usually on these, what we call irregular bones, um, the false starts are not as uh, common. 
The direction of blade, again, and the direction of cutting stroke uh, was not, um, I was not able to identify it, again, because of the type of, of bone that we're using here. However, we were able to identify teeth per inch. So if you're looking at the bone all the way to the end uh, where you see that little bump, there's actually a groove there and there were several bumps that I was able to measure. And those actually gave me a measurement of 4.5 teeth per inch. Okay, uh, and uh, so everyone's clear, at the end of going through all of the different uh, limbs that were severed, we're going to talk in a holistically with a table, talk about what these measurements look like together. Correct? Yeah, we will put them together so that everybody can um, understand. All right, and we'll move on to the dismemberment of the, the right uh, humerus. Yep, so we're looking again at the right arm. Um, so we have a full view, which is the front, and then I'm also showing you kind of the inside. So medial is just pretty much kind of towards the center of the body. Um, so first of all, I'm looking for false, false starts. And um, the right proximal had four uh, cut marks that are consistent with false starts. Okay. Uh, were you able to determine uh, blade progress in the cutting stroke? Yes, so the blade progress in this case was from back to front. Um, and also the cutting stroke um, pretty much started on the medial, right? So it was from the inside, cutting all the way to the outside, right? So from back to front and from inside to outside. Um, another thing that I noticed is that now I'm looking at pretty much the whole area that was cut. And that whole area, I noticed that there was non-uniform striations. So pretty much they were all over the place. Um, and indicating that there was a reciprocating action, right? So if you're cutting back and forth, um, and it's also with a straight blade. The reason why it's a straight blade is because those striations were straight, right? They were not circular. And perhaps here we're getting a pretty good look at what you meant by the, the spur at the bottom. Yes. So you can actually kind of see a little bit of the difference in the color. Um, that is the breakaway notch. That breakaway notch is not very big. Um, and we will go over and you will see uh, some of the characteristics that I was talking about, some of the features that we were talking about. Sure. Uh, sticking with the same bone, uh, were you able to determine teeth per inch that was used in the whatever instrument was used to dismember this body part? Yes, so um, I was able again to look at the area that was cut and there were several several areas where you can see bumps and, and kind of grooves. So those bumps were measured. Here I'm showing you um, just one so that you guys can get an idea of how it is. Um, and overall the teeth per inch were 20 to 14.3 teeth per inch in this particular bone. Again, sticking with the right arm, were you able to determine the saw set width? Yes. So again, going back to that breakaway spur, um, in this breakaway spur, you can see on that little red square that that end is flat bottom and is squared, right? So that's when the blade goes all the way down, it hits that point, right? So that's where it breaks, right? Um, so that area over there is flat bottom and is square, which is indicative of a rip saw. Sure. Let's talk about the left arm or the left humerus. Um, talk to me about the false starts that you were able to identify. Sure. So on this one, we do have a little bit more false starts. So we have about 11 cut marks that are consistent with a false start. Were you able to determine blade progress in the cutting strokes direction? Sure. So on this one, um, pretty much the cut was made from back to front, um, and the cutting stroke was pretty much from the lateral, so from the outside all the way to the inside. So the cutting motion was from back, from side to inside. And uh, were you able to determine teeth per inch? Yes, so this is an image. Um, so some of the measurements, most of the measurements are taken under a microscope, right? Because you do wanna look at those, you know, small areas that you cannot potentially see with the naked eye. So this is a, um, an image um, from a stereo microscope, um, and we're looking again at that bone. Um, the area that is in the square, in that red square, is um, pretty much um, for you guys to see um, the divots and the dips, right? So we actually measured the distances between those, and those actually gave us about 20 to 16.7 teeth per inch. Okay. Again, you're looking at non-uniform striations, right? So those striations are 
uh, non-uniform, they're pretty much kind of all over, which is indicative that is a very inconsistent, right? Um, that is a reciprocating motion um, with a straight blade because those are actually straight, right? Okay. Uh, let's start talking about the legs. Uh, let's start with the, the right leg, the right femur. So in the right femur, we actually, I actually saw two cut marks which are consistent with false starts. Sure. And just to, to point out, the jury is able to actually see them. Those are those red lines on that left picture, correct? Yeah, so if you see, if you follow the arrows, you will see just below the arrows, you will see the first one, and then just below that one, you will see the second one. And so those represent times that the saw hit the bone, cut, but didn't go all the way through, and then it was attempted again. That is correct. Okay. Again, same questions. Let's talk about when we deal with the, the right leg, the direction of blade progress and the cutting stroke. Sure. So um, here, first of all, um, I try to identify the breakaway. So is it a notch or is it a spur? So in this case, we have a notch. If you can see it on that red square um, that I have um, in the presentation. And that is, again, what is going to help me determine, OK, was the blade progress from front to back in this case. And then the direction of cutting stroke was a little bit more different here. The cut was a little bit um, more clean. Um, so I was not able to really determine where, um, how the cutting stroke was. In order for me to determine that, I usually look at kind of some chips of bone on the side, some different um, features. And in this case, I did not see any of those features in the bone. Okay. Were you able to determine teeth per inch? I was. Again, we have an image from the microscope and then um, pretty much an image from a, fo a photo of the actual bone so that you guys can see um, where I'm coming from with this uh, microscopic image. And you can see on the arrows that those are all the grooves and dips that were used to determine teeth per inch. As you can see on this one, we have a lot, right? So we have um, about 25 to 14 teeth per inch that were calculated from all of those. And then you can also see on this one the striations, right? So the striations kind of go all over the place, right? Most of them are straight. Um, and then they exhibit, again, that reciprocating motion um, with a series of striations in, this, in different anatomical planes. That is important for me because it's telling me that it's an inconsistent cut, right? Um, that is pretty much cutting and cutting in multiple, multiple um, anatomical planes, right? I'm cutting from the front and then I go back, I go sideways. So it is an inconsistent cut. Uh, and of course you looked into how uh, wide the saw set was here. Yes, so again, we look at the breakaway uh, spur um, and the notch, um, and in this case, again, I'm looking at the shape. And in this case, we do have a curved floor, and you can see over there on the L, um, the red one, um, that is flat bottom, that is squared, um, which is consistent with a rip saw. Um, and also, we were able to um, measure, which is points, 0.07, uh, which is indicating an approximation of the blade, of the width of the blade. Got it. Okay, let's talk about the left leg. Um, I, I think that's the final one for Mr. Halderson. Um, the left femur uh, here, were you able to observe any false starts? I was. In this case, we were able to um, see one cut mark, which is consistent with a false start. And again, it is, um, if you can see at the arrows, it's just pretty much below that aerial. And here is a microscopic view of that false start. Yes. Um, this false start was actually very informative. Remember when I mentioned the deeper the false start, the better? So this one is, was quite deep. Um, so I was able to measure, and then it gave me a lot of information. It gave me information about pretty much the width of the blade, which was 0 0.04, and also told me that there was a little bit of um, information about there was a wavy set blade. Um, that is usually related to fine tooth um, hacksaw blades. Um, a wavy set is just pretty much when the blade goes from one side, the tooth, the tooth go from one side, it go to the other side, and then there's kind of in between, right? So there's a little bit of irregularities there, and that is going to be seen on the actual false start itself. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, blade progress and cutting stroke here? Here, again, we have um, a little bit of an entrance shaving. Um, so it's giving me the blade progress. So this bone was actually cut from back to front. And the cutting stroke is telling me that um, 
the blade entered through the back of the bone and it went through the front. So it started on the back and then it goes all the way to the front. So anatomically, if a person's standing up, literally from their, their back forward. Yes, pretty much. Okay. Uh, let's talk about teeth per inch and, and the inconsistent cut that you observed. So again, I wanted to show you uh, pretty much where those teeth per inch were measured from. So you can see again those, those um, little uh, dips and, and grooves. Here we have 16.7 to 12.5 teeth per inch. And then I'm giving you a microscopic view of the bone itself. And on this one, you can really see the inconsistency, right? Those striations are straight, right? So it's telling me that it's a straight blade. Um, however, the striations go in multiple anatomical planes. So it's telling me the inconsistency of the cut, right? So we go down, then we go up, then we go to the medial aspect. Um, and the same pattern is seen across the entire wall. Sure. And perhaps this slide's a good time to ask this question, but why are the teeth per inch expressed in a range? Um, so this is an estimation, right? So every time we do an anthropological analysis, I always tell this is not a determination. This is an estimate, right? So I'm looking a, at depending on how many areas I can measure, right? So you wanna give a range. Also, you wanna take into account, um, there's a lot of outliers, right? So you'd have to take into account the type of tool that was used. Was the tool new? Was the tool had a wear and tear? There's a lot of variables and a lot of features that I cannot account for, right? Also the individual itself, the position of the body in terms to the individual. So those are the reasons why we always give an estimate. And within that estimate, we give a range. When it comes to Mr. Halderson, um, and we're gonna go to some more summary slides in a second, but when it comes to the dismemberment of, of his head, his arms and his legs, um, are, they, are any of those, were any of those dismemberments in your view performed with power saws? No, I would say at this point, um, the examination and the analysis really goes towards a handsaw. Um, again, we're looking at very inconsistent cuts. Um, we're also looking at the striations, right? Those striations are telling me that um, there is pretty much a straight blade, right? It's not a circular blade. Um, in addition to that, you wanna look at the breakaway spur, right? That breakaway spur is very important and they're not quite, they're not very big, which is indicative that there was not a lot of energy, right? So that's one of the reasons why, you know, you wanna use a power, you know, a power driven saw, right? Because you wanna have a clean cut that is consistent and in, there's a lot of energy there, right? When you're using your hands, there's not gonna be a lot of energy there. So therefore, the breakaway spur is gonna be small and the cut is gonna be inconsistent, right? Because especially in this case, when you're thinking about the femur, the femur is one of the thickest bones in your body. So it takes a lot of energy and a lot of force to cut through that bone. And you can kind of see it here on that um, microscopic view. It is, it is quite thick. Sure. When it comes to Mr. Halderson, um, were you aware he was found uh, at a rural farm in the woods? Yes. Uh, and were you on that location? Were you there? I was not. Were you made aware at some point that there were some tools uh, or saws found uh, near the remains uh, that were suspected to have been used in the dismemberment? I was made aware. And you were provided information regarding those tools? Yes, they were providing me with some photos. Okay, and uh, what were you able to determine? Uh, you had what you needed from these photographs, correct? Yep. Okay, and, and tell us why that was important. You looked at it and what information you were able to glean from just looking at the tools. Sure, so again, we go to back to teeth per inch. That is a measurement that I can take just with a simple photograph and scales. Um, so in this case, I wanted to pretty much gather the information and all the characteristics to see if those actually match what I was able to see on the bone. So the first thing that I look at was the Elway super saw, which I try to figure it out and is considered to be a keyhole saw or similar to a carpenter saw. Um, so first of all, I was able to measure and it has si around 16 teeth per inch. Then there is a distance between the teeth of 0 0.06 inches, and then it has a flat chiseling tooth, which is consistent with a rib saw. Um, there was a second item, which was a broken hacksaw. Um, so I was able to measure, and that one had about four teeth per inch. Um, and it had a distance between teeth of five 
I'm sorry, a 0.19 inches to 0.31 inches. Um, and again, this is a flat chiseling tooth consistent with a rib saw, and it also had a saw tooth consistent with a wavy set. Okay. So now you have the measurements of all of those, those false starts, which give you the blade width and the teeth per inch and things of that sort. And now you have some suspected saws. You're able to compare all of those things, right? Yeah, that is the goal of the analysis. Are you able to definitively say 100% what saw was used? No. Are you, are you able to say what saws were consistent with which cuts? Yes, I can use the class. So I'm using the characteristics, right? The class characteristics of what I found on the bone. And I want to know, are they consistent with the class characteristic of these suspected tools, right? So I'm not going to be able to say, yes, this is the tool that was used. But we can say, don't exclude it or exclude it from your analysis or from the investigation. And here's uh, perhaps a, a summary of, of what we're talking about. Here we have the fourth cervical vertebrae, the right humerus, the left humerus, the right femur, the left femur, and then the two saws at the end. And here you're putting everything on a table. Yes. Okay. So it's pretty much a summary So because it's a lot of information. Um, so that way you guys can pretty much um, do your own comparisons, right? Um, so in this case, um, what I did is I put all the distance between teeth. Um, and you can kind of see that most of them pretty much fit within that range, right? So I'm trying to see, is there something that fits within the range? Um, the same with teeth per inch. The same with minimum curve or just pretty much the saw set width. Um, the cutting motion, right? Is it a reciprocating motion? Um, the blade shape, is it straight or is it circular? And then also the saw set, right? Is it a rip saw, a crust cut? So in this case, I can say that the class characteristics that I saw on the elements or on the skeletal elements are consistent with the class characteristic of those two tools that were found um, at the site. Sure. Uh, is, are all of them consistent with the same tool or is, are one of them consistent more with one tool than others? Yeah, so actually the fourth cervical vertebrae seems to be a little bit more consistent with the broken hacksaw. And then the other elements, the right humerus, the left humerus, the right femur, and the left femur are more consistent with the uh, keyhole or the Alway super saw. Sure. So if we go back a slide, uh, you're saying the vertebrae, or the fourth cervical vertebrae, uh, where the head was removed, consistent with that image on the right of the broken hacksaw blade, and the limbs consistent with the all-way saw on the left. That is correct. Okay. Um, that's, we'll conclude with Mr. Halderson, and, and we'll move on to what's labeled Joe, or Doe, or a Jane Doe, ultimately. Um, we heard the medical examiners testify about these different body parts that were found um, it, of, of Krista Halderson, or what they identified as Krista Halderson. You identified part of them as Krista Halderson and part of them as Doe. Can you tell me why? So, obviously, at the time, um, they were found. They were found in. In in kind of the same area, but they were found apart, right? So I cannot scientifically. I cannot pretty much say that they're both the same, even though. Potentially, right, based on the case circumstances, once you're trying to put everything together, I could potentially say that they are to, they belong to the same individual. Scientifically, I cannot do that, right? So I pretty much have to rely on DNA or an anthropological analysis in order to say that they both belong to the same individual. Sure. And so when it comes to, and we'll combine up for the purposes of this question, Jane Doe and Krista Halderson, not only were you trying to answer the same question with, as you did with Mr. Halderson, which was what tools were used or how did this happen, but you were also trying to figure out, is this the same person? That is correct. So two questions there. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 376. Is this your report regarding uh, Doe? That is correct. Okay. I'll move 376. No objection. It is received. Talk to me a little bit about how you became involved in, in the summary of, of the early stages of this investigation. Sure. So pretty much, again, um, there were several uh, human remains that were found in the area on July 14. Um, once those remains uh, were found, um, it was determined that it was um, a set of human remains consisting of um, a left leg um, and also a potential right leg as well. Um, on July 16, there was an autopsy conducted. Um, and once the autopsy was conducted, um, we pretty much did the same. Um, we actually removed all the elements, uh, mass, uh, dissected and then macerated the elements in water and let them air dry. In this case, we had a little bit more of information and more skeletal remains. So we had, um, like I said, the left leg, um, the feet, as well as a potential right leg. 
So same process here, you macerate it in water to remove the skeletal remains, essentially the bones from the legs. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, can I ask you, uh, were you on scene in this occasion? I was not. Okay. Are you aware of what the scene conditions were? in terms of how the remains were found, in terms of any uh, insect activity or maggot activity? Yeah, I was able to look at some of the photographs. Is it your opinion that any of those things affected your ability to obtain any results here? I would say potentially for the identification, yes. Um, the identification um, on one of them was a little bit more difficult than on the other one. Um, on the other one, DNA was still available. On the other one, the elements and the outdoor elements really uh, took a toll on, on, on the human remains, and those, um, we were not able to get DNA out of them. Sure. Talk to me about the skeletal inventory of, of, of Jane Doe uh, in this case. So in this case, um, we have what you can call maybe um, a full-on right leg, right? So we have the right femur, we have the tibia and fibula, which composes of kind of your lower leg, and then we have um, the left foot and the right foot. And then if you can see just at the top of that left foot, there's two little pieces of bone. So those are the ends of the fibula and the tibia, right? So if you see to your right, that is the full on bone. And then to your left, that's just a little bit of piece, a little bit of, of what is supposed to be a full on uh, tibia and, and fibula. So the same with Mr. Halderson, uh, the same with Doe, you're gonna have some, some trauma to look at here and try to examine? Yes, especially to that right, um, right femur because we're missing the head. Um, and then obviously we're missing um, a really big part of the tibia and the fibula. All right, let's talk about that. Let's start with the right uh, femur. Uh, did you observe any false starts? I did not. Okay, tell, and, me, okay. Yeah, tell me about blade progress or cutting stroke or what you were able to observe. So in terms of the blade progress, I was able to determine that this was cut from back to front. Um, and then the cutting stroke actually started um, from the medial side, from the inside all the way to the outside, right? So it was cut from back to front, and then the cut actually started from the inside all the way to the outside. Talk to me about, were you able to observe on that bone teeth per inch and the blade set width? Yes, so in this case, we were able to determine that it was about 20 to 12.5 teeth per inch. Um, again, it was an inconsistent cut. We're looking at very inconsistent uh, striations, right? Um, they're straight, which is suggestive of a straight blade. Um, and again, is in very different anatomical uh, planes. The reason why I included a photograph of, again, the microscopic view is so that you guys can see really those striations and how different they are, right? So the more inconsistent it is, um, the, more, the more inconsistent the striations, the more inconsistent the cut. Um, in terms of blade set, um, I was able to determine that it was about 0 0.05 inches of a width. Um, actually, on this one, I was able to determine as well that the curved flo floor is flat bottom and a square, again, indicative of a rib saw. Uh, talk about the left tibia, if you could. Yeah, so this is the end of the tibia. This is what makes your ankle. Um, so here you can see that there is at least five cut marks, uh, which are consistent with... Um, false starts. And this one is a little bit difficult to see it because the bone kind of turns. So the cuts are actually going all the way from the front of that image all the way to the side. Okay. Were you able to make with the, the tibia, that tibia that makes up the ankle, were you, were you able to make any conclusions as to the blade progress or the cutting stroke? Yes. So in this case, we were able to look at the blade progress. The blade progress, again, was cut from front to back, and then the cutting stroke, how that knife entered through, was actually ent entering through um, the lateral, so pretty much the outside, and it goes all the way to the inside. So the cutting motion was from the outside to the inside. Um, again, non-uniform striations all over, um, which are indicative of a reciprocating motion, and again, an inconsistent cut. Sure. Uh, speaking with, again, same bone, we're talking about that ankle. Were you able to determine teeth per inch and the blade set width? Yes, so you can see pretty much on these red squares, again, those dips and those grooves, we were able to determine about 25 teeth per inch. And then the blade set, um, again, we were able to give an estimate about the width and say that is a rip saw based on the curve floor, again, which was flat and squared. Let's talk about the left fibula. 
Um, the left fibula, um, again, so the left fibula goes next to that other bone that you just saw. So that, again, makes up for your ankle. Um, so we have about um, a blade, we have a false start. This false start was actually quite deep. So again, it gives me a lot of information about the blade set. So I was able to measure and it gave me 0 0.04 inches um, for a blade set. Um, again, it's suggestive of a raker set, which is, again, fine tooth, um, consistently usually with bow saws or pruning saws. And staying with the left fibula, um, blade progress, cutting stroke? So in this case, this bone was actually cut from front to back. Um, and then the cutting motion was very similar to the tibia, because you have to think about it, they're both right um, next to each other. So it was pretty much cut um, from the medial, yeah, through the medial and then going all the way to the outside, right? So um, it's very consistent with the tibia that we just saw. Um, again, non-uniform striations, which are indicative of reciprocating motion and is also a straight blade. Um, in this case, we're looking at teeth per inch and it's about 20 teeth per inch. And the blade set, again, was consistent with a rib saw. I added a photo of the microscope, microscopic image, so that you guys can see where those dips and those grooves were so that we can measure those and get those teeth per inch. Sure. As to Jane Doe, you reached some conclusions. I did. Um, pretty much um, in this case, according to the blade set, we can categorize these characteristics into a hack saw, a potential rip saw, or also a keyhole saw. Um, there was a curve width a little bit higher, which was about 0 0.07 to 0 0.08, which is indicative of a cross cut or a carpenter saw. Um, pretty much all skeletal elements show me that there was a flat bottom, right, at that breakaway spur, and that it was squared, which is indicative of a rip saw tooth. Um, and finally, pretty much in terms of teeth per inch, all of them were between 25 all the way to 12. Um, the striations were all straight, which is indicative of a straight blade. Um, they were non-uniform and in different anatomical, place, anatomical planes. Again, this is consistent with a hand saw, right, versus that power-driven saw. Regarding all the cuts uh, that you saw, the dismemberment cuts with Jane Doe, are they consistent with the blades that we've previously looked at, at least in, in characteristics, the keyhole saw and the broken hacksaw blade? Yeah, so all the characteristics of this particular um, individual were consistent, again, with the characteristics of those two tools that were found at the scene. Understood. Now, uh, you indicated that there were some human remains found nearby that were, by DNA, positively identified to Krista Halderson. You had to write a separate report for that set of remains, correct? That is correct. All right, I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 377. Uh, is that, in fact, that report? That is correct. I'll move that 377 report into evidence. No objection. It is received. And again, same questions. Here, we're going to talk about is Krista Halderson also Jane Doe, but also the same thing of how were these cuts made, right? That's correct. Good. All right. Uh, talk to me. The same general observations about your, how you became involved in this investigation with Krista? Yeah, so pretty much on July 14, again, there was two sets of human remains that were found. Um, and then in this case, pretty much the reason why we had to um, assign two different case numbers, right? Scientifically, I cannot say that they're both the same. So um, based on not just um, DNA, but also the anthropological analysis, we try to narrow it down to see if in fact these remains are, do, do belong to Krista. All right, same process of, of, of essentially before, uh, but you attended, or you, there was an autopsy performed and then the remains were transferred to you for your work at some point. That is correct. In this case, um, in addition to the sharp first trauma, right, and the type of analysis that we're trying to do, we're also trying to identify the individual and try to see if by what I do is a morphological analysis. So I look at the shape and I look at the size and I also look at the measurement. So I measure the bone and I try to pretty much analyze and see if they actually um, are similar to each other. Uh, same process, macerated in water, the skeletal remains were air dried and then you perform some analysis. That is correct. All right, let's talk about the skeletal inventory of Krista Halderson. So in this case, um, the skeletal inventory consisted of just the shaft of the femur, right? So if you have your leg, I'm missing pretty much the top part of it. Um, the distal end, which is the part that makes up your knee, um, was still there, but it was actually um, 
separated. Um, we have a patella, which is your kneecap, and that one belongs to the left side. We also have a left fibula and a left proximal um, shaft of the tibia. Again, that's your lower leg, but we're missing those two ends of it. All right, so uh, let's perform the same work as we have. Let's start with the, the left femur. Uh, were you able to observe false starts there? We did. So we're looking at the top part of the femur, right? So we had pretty much the shaft. So this is just the top, and we're looking at one superficial start, uh, false start. Okay. Uh, able to determine blade progress and cutting stroke? Yes. In this case, we can say that the bone was cut from front to back, and that the cutting stroke was actually from the front all the way to the back. So pretty much the blade was entering through the front and cutting all the way to the back. Okay. Were you able to determine teeth branch? Yes. So in this case, um, we were able to determine about 9.1 teeth per inch and 6.7 to 5.9 teeth per inch. Um, again, the striations. Um, and the breakaway spur um, actually gave me indications that this was a reciprocating motion. Um, and then the floor itself gave me information about the width of the blade. Sure. And there are we looking at a close-up of the microscopic view of that? Yeah, so that's pretty much how I was able to calculate the teeth per inch. So I'm looking again at the top part of that bone, and I'm looking, that is a breakaway spur, um, and I'm actually looking under the microscope at that breakaway spur. And then, oh. Sorry. The no, image. you're fine. And then um, the second one is the actual floor, right? So remember that once it cuts, that floor in between that breakaway spur or notch in the actual cut. That area in between is very important. That's what we call the floor. And on that one, I was able to determine that it was, again, flat bottom and it was squared, which is suggestive of a rip saw. And then we were able to measure it in order to get a little bit of information about the blade set. Let's talk about um, Krista Halderson's left femur. Yeah, so in this case, um, if you remember, these were two separated items on this skeletal inventory. So what I did is I put them back together. Um, and you can kind of see on those arrows, all of those are false starts. Um, we had a total of 10 false starts, and some of them were quite deep. Sure. Uh, this is more false starts than we've seen in some of the previous images of, of Bart and, and Jane Doe, correct? That is correct. Um, false starts are, are, are attempts. Uh, so one explanation, it, it could be someone is getting fatigued. That's possible? Yeah, it could be an explanation. Sure. Um, or they're just having trouble. Yeah, it could be another. Okay. Uh, talk to me about um, th those false starts and what we're looking at there. So what I did is I actually looked at under a microscope because I saw they were quite deep. So again, it gives me a lot of information. So in this case, um, I was able to um, get a little bit of information about the blade, the width of the blade. Um, and I was also able to determine that it was a curved set blade. Again, that's because of the shape of the actual um, false start alone. Um, Raker sets are usually considered to be just fine tooth, um, bow saws or pruning saws or sometimes keyhole saws, depending on the brand. Uh, talk to me about blade progress and, and the cutting stroke. So in this case, um, you're looking at kind of the medial view of that bone. So remember, I put it back together and we are able, to, so we're looking kind of the inside, almost by your knee. Um, and you can see the red arrow is the one that gives you the blade progress. So the, the bone was actually cut from the inside all the way to the outside. So that's how the cut actually was made. The cutting stroke or the blade actually entered through, was cutting through the front. So that cutting motion was from front to back. All right, were we able to determine teeth per inch for this cut? So again, we look under the microscope and we had about 12 teeth per inch um, on average on the striations in those dips and grooves. Um, again, the striations um, were indicative of a reciprocating motion um, in different anatomical planes. Again, we're looking for that, we're, we're seeing that inconsistent cut throughout. And the blade set width. Yeah, in this case, we had a um, really defined um, uh, floor. In this case, it was very um, flat bottom. It was squared. You can see it over there on the L, um, which is indicative, again, on that rip saw. And then it was also able to give me information about the blade set. 
All right, so we talked about those two questions, which is, is Doe and Krista the same person? And then we're gonna talk about the tools, but starting with uh, Doe and, and Krista, what are we looking at there? So we're comparing, so what I try to do is to compare each element, right? So I know I have two femora, right? So in this case, what I did is I put them together just to pretty much try to understand the shape and the size, right? Aside from that, I try to take measurements. In this case, um, I was a little bit, um, I was not able to take a lot of measurements because I'm missing the top part. And most of the measurements that we do take involve that, that uh, top part. So I was able to measure the bottoms, right? So pretty much the distance um, from that area, that kind of wider area that you have, that's where your knee kind of forms. So I was able to measure that and that, um, the right one gave me about 74 millimeters and the left one gave me 73 millimeters. Tell us about this slide. So we're looking here at the left tibia. So pretty much your lower leg. So we're looking at that lower end of the tibia that is very close to forming your ankle. Um, and here you can see multiple false starts. Um, the left tibia exhibits at least six cut marks that are consistent with false starts. Sure. And this is a more close-up view of that? Yes. Again, these were quite deep, so it gives me a lot of information. Um, so we wanted to look at them under the microscope. Um, and under the microscope, we were able to see, again, a blaze set width um, of about 0 0.01. Um, and again, those were flat bottom, and they were squared. The walls were squared, so that is indicative of a rip saw. Okay. Uh and here you had to determine blade progress and cutting stroke, of course. Yeah, so again, we're looking at the whole uh, bone, the whole lower left leg, um, the red arrow, which is indicative of the blade progress. So it seems like this bone was cut from front to back. And then the cutting stroke of how that knife went through, how that saw went through, it went through um, the anterior, so the front of it, and it kind of went down to medial. So it went from front to side a little bit. So it was almost in an angle. Okay. And lastly, uh, when it comes to the, at least the measurements, you had to determine teeth per inch. And, and here we have maybe an overall view and then a microscopic view? That is correct. Okay. Um, so here we're looking again at those um, grooves and those dips, and we have about 5.6 to 4.8 teeth per inch. Okay. So now we're just going to compare, essentially, the Krista to Doe in, in almost like a puzzle-like fashion. Okay? Yeah. Tell me what you're doing there. So I'm pretty much trying to compare, and again, in this case, I'm not just uh, looking at the shape and the size and the measurements, but I'm also trying to see if it actually fits together, right? So if they can join. Um, so in this case, we have the distal end, right, that ankle part of dough, and then we have what we already know and was positively identified as Krista. And as you can see on the photos, it actually conjoins fairly well. Um, so obviously we were able to also take some measurements and look at the morphological, you know, overview, the size and the shape, and it, it was a close match. Okay. And uh, here's perhaps a table um, comparing them. Yes, so these are all the measurements that I was able to take. These are standard measurements that we use whenever we are trying to identify someone. Um, and these are specified for the tibia and the fibula. Um, and as you can see, most of the element, most of the measurements are quite similar, right? Um, in addition to that, you wanna look at the overall shape and size of the bone, right? So that's why we wanna put it all together in one image so that you guys can see based to the, next to a scale how similar Similar they are. Sure. And so next we have a slide about the left fibula. Yes. So here the left fibula, um, again, we do have one false start um, located um, just below the initial corner of the cap curve. Right. And uh, here we have blade progress and cutting stroke again. I just briefly described that. Yeah, pretty much very similar to the tibia, right? It's next to the tibia. So it was cut from front to back, and the cutting stroke was pretty much entering through the inside and exiting through the outside. Okay. And then the teeth per inch. The teeth per inch in this case was about 11.1 .1 teeth per inch. And again, we go back to its non-uniform straight striations. Um, it's a reciprocating action with a straight blade. 
And then before we get to the summary, uh, here just is a comparison uh, at a different end or a different view, correct? Yes. So we just wanted to compare, right, that dough, that little piece of bone that we found that makes your ankle. And we wanted to compare it and see. And then you can see here it actually matches fairly well. Sure. Um, I, I think I asked this before with, with Mr. Halderson, but as to, to dough and Krista, before we get to the summary, is all of these cuts uh, from your estimation were made with hand saws, not power saws, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and... Uh, there were two saws in here found near Bart Halderson, not Krista Halderson, but you use those in, at least in considering making a table uh, regarding how these, which saws were possibly used in, to cut Krista Halderson's uh, legs. That is correct. All right. And we're looking at the table there? Yes. All right. Um, so it's a very similar table to the other one. Sure. Uh, is it your opinion that those two saws on this slide, the, the Alway saw and the broken hacksaw, are they, um, should they be ruled out as possibly the saws that were used to dismember Christus Lakes? They should not be ruled out. Okay. Tell us about this slide. So pretty much in terms of um, right, trying to, under, trying to identify the other set of remains that we had as dough. Um, so in this case, as I mentioned, they were able to identify one set of human remains as Krista Halderson via DNA. The other set of remains, um, the tissue was quite mummified, so we were not able to really obtain DNA out of that second set of remains. However, we were able to do an anthropological analysis, so we were able to measure, we were able to compare the size and the shape, and given all of that information, Information, um, this association can really provide a means to identify that second set of human remains as Christo. Sure. So if we started at the beginning with those questions as to Bart, were those saws consistent with the, his dismemberment? Your answer was, was yes, yes. Those two saws. Uh, and as to Krista and what you identified as dough as being Krista, those saws are consistent? Yeah, all the class characteristics are consistent. And then you were able to, the third question, uh, you were able to positively identify dough essentially as being Krista. Yeah, it's pretty much giving you the information to say that, yes, um, the second set of remains is consistent with Krista. Sure. The next part of your work here and the last part. Would you like any water? I'm good. Okay. Uh, you were asked at, at times to actually go over to the Halderson home on Oak Springs in Windsor uh, to assist them in, in uh, some remains they were finding at the home, correct? That is correct. Uh, what is your role when you're called to a crime scene like that? In this particular case, they were calling um, our office in order to determine if the remains, if what they have at the house was actually human remains or not. Sure. And did you actually go over to the house? I did. Okay. I'm showing it's been marked in this case as exhibit number 378. Uh, is this your report related to uh, your visits to the Halderson home? That is correct. Uh, were you there on a couple different occasions? I was. Okay. When you were at the Halderson home doing this work, were you by yourself or were you assisted by other people both in, in law enforcement to assist you in some of your work? Yeah, so the first time that I was called, um, pretty much there were several investigators there, um, and I was able to do kind of a quick analysis. Um, they were pretty much trying to determine, right, do we have human remains here or not? Because if so, then obviously there's a different type of approach that we need to take um, when we're trying to write, search, and recover those remains. Um, so on the first, the first time that I went there, um, I actually was shown to the house and then shown to what they thought were human remains. Um, um, and then once we determined that there were in fact human remains, we did a second uh, visit. And on that second visit, it was a little bit more labor intensive in order to try to pinpoint and find all the human remains. Uh, and before we start, we're going to hear about a couple different areas or things you searched in the home. Um, but your analysis was, was the, the fireplace itself, the fireplace grate, the ash pit below the fireplace, a vacuum, and then a fire pit in the backyard. That is correct. And just to start off, there was nothing in that fire pit in the backyard, was no, there? No, there was none. All right, and let's start with the vacuum cleaner. Um, you at some point examined a vacuum cleaner that was found in the, in the Halderson home? That is correct. Okay, and is that in fact the vacuum cleaner? That is the vacuum cleaner. Um, what happened? How did you examine it? And tell us what we're looking at here. So we pretty much dissected the vacuum, so we almost did an autopsy on the vacuum. Um, so we remove everything from it, 
um, so that we can get to the inside. So we documented every single step of the way. Um, and what you're looking at is pretty much what we were able to recover from the inside of the vacuum, right? So there's a lot of dust. Um, however, there were other elements there um, that we were able to recover. Sure. And I'm going to ask you about a couple of those. Um, let's just start maybe on the far right side of that tray. Um, uh, there's some paper looking material. What is that? You mean the far, the white paper that is shredded? Yeah, let's okay. start there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, were you able to identify that as anything other than just paper? It was just shredded paper, yeah. Okay, above that there's a small pile of, of looks to be debris. Were you able to identify that at all? Seems, we were not really able to ID. It seems like it was more like seeds and kind of random things that you find outside. Okay. Yeah. And if we keep moving counterclockwise, I suppose around, um, there's a pile of, of clear material there. Uh, almost looks like rock salt. Um, what is that? That was actually glass. And um, during this case, while you were in the Halderstone, did you have an opportunity to actually look through the fireplace yourself? Uh, I did. And is that glass consistent with glass you found in the fireplace? There was broken glass in the fireplace. Okay. Uh, slightly to the left of that, continuing going counterclockwise, there appears to be a pile of debris. What is that? We were not 100% sure. Seems like it was almost like burn, something kind of woodish. Um, we were not really able to identify that very well. Sure. Uh, it was quite dark. And we'll save the bottom left corner for a second, but in the, in the very center appears to be a pile of dirt. Is that what it is? Yeah, it was just dirt from normal vacuum. And in the bottom, there's some dog hair, pretty much. I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, there's some white rocks, and, and so the judge is clear on the record. I'm pointing to the bottom left uh, corner of this tray. What are those? That is bone. Um, how are you able to tell it's bone? Again, by the size and the shape and the morphology, right? So bone is very unique. Um, so when you're looking at bone, you're looking at two types of bone. One, remember that spongy look like bone that we had in the cervical vertebrae? So that's one type of bone, and that's usually on the inside, right? Um, you wanna think about it as um, a sponge that has little holes, and those little holes are the ones that kind of give you the nutrients, right? That's where the blood vessels, that's kind of the reasoning for that. The outside of the bone is called compact bone. I always think about it as concrete. It looks like cement, right? So it's usually the outside of it. That, the reason because it's like, the reason why it's like that is because it gives you the shape, right? So the inside is very hollow so that you can get the nutrients and the outside is the one that gives you the shape. So you do want that to be really strong and really hard. Um, so whenever you have bone pieces, I'm always looking for that. I'm looking for that spongy bone and that really uh, concrete or compact bone. And there were several features on those little fragments that can tell me that that was bone. In, in relatively to other fragments you may have found in this investigation in the Halderstone, were those somewhat small? They are very small and very fragile. So we talked about it, it being bone, and, and, and just so no one's confused, you, you cannot positively say that's human bone, correct? No, I can't. Okay. What's the difference between what you're able to identify as bone and what you can positively identify as human bone? What are you looking for? So I'm looking for, again, features, right? So the morphological features, the size and the shape. Aside from that, I'm also looking, so bone is the one that is response, so the bone actually attaches to the muscle, right? So those areas actually have some bu bumps and grooves that are very unique to the bone, right? So as an anthropologist and as an osteologist, right, somebody that knows the bones really well. I know where all those features are, right? So I know where, where each muscle attaches. I know the features of each bone as well, right? So facets, like those flat areas where it attaches to another bone. So me knowing the features and the characteristics of each human bone, I can actually look at another fragment and say, yes, this is human, this is not human, right? We do get training on non-human remains, right? So deer, dogs, anything else that we know potentially could be um, of, of, of an analysis in the future. Sure. Are you able to say whether or not, or what type of bone that is? Whether it's an animal bone or whether it is a human bone? No, I can't. All you can say is bone. I can say that it's bone. I cannot say that it's human. Okay. Um, let's talk about the fireplace itself. Now, this is the physical fireplace. You observed this, correct? Yes, I did. All right. I'm um, showing the, what's already been admitted is 239. Uh, is that the fireplace, in fact, that, that you observed? Yes. 
Uh, showing further uh, what's been identified and admitted to evidence is 324. Um, there's a spot on the top of the fireplace, kind of there in the center, that was of interest to people? Yes, that is the reason why I was called in the first place. Um, and just to go back, we're talking about the spot on the very center of that photograph? Yeah, that white spot, yes. Okay. Uh, were you able to take that, that little piece off at some point? So when I arrived to the residence, that piece was actually already removed by one of the investigators. And did you take a look at it? I did. Okay. Um, are we looking at it there? Yeah, it's just a nicer picture of it. And here it's labeled skeletal inventory, um, but could you tell us what we're looking at there in, in some of these nicer photos that are maybe a, a, be, a bit better lit than the photos on scene? Sure. Um, so this is actually that little piece of bone that you guys saw in that other picture. Um, so when I was, looked, um, when I was asked, asked to look at the photo and look at the remains, um, the main question was, is this bone? And if so, is this human? So the first thing that I can tell you is that it is bone, right? Remember that categorization of spongy bone and compact bone? So you can actually see it um, in this image. You can kind of see that sponge in between, and you can kind of see that compact bone in the top um, also and on the back. The second thing that I can tell you is that this is potentially consistent with cranial bone or bone from the skull. The reason for that is because, um, so the skull is very unique and the skull is composed of three layers of bone. So we have that compact bone, that cement looking like bone. Then we have spongy bone in the middle and then we have another layer which is compact bone. So it's almost like a sandwich, right? So as bone, especially in this case, potentially underwent uh, fire damage or thermal damage, that first layer of bone is going to be destroyed and it's going to expose that second layer. So that's what it's telling me that is potentially associated with the skull or the head. Um, and then in this case, I know you guys can't see it very well, but there's actually a cranial suture. So as you grow, you right now have close to 206 bones, but when you were little, you probably had more. And the reason for that is because all of those bones are gonna fuse, right? So the same happens with the skull. Those bones are gonna fuse, and those lines of fusion are what we call sutures or cranial sutures. So those lines of fusion are very informative for us. It can give us information about age, um, sometimes can give us other information related to ancestral background. So in this case, I can see on one of the edges that it is a suspected cranial uh, suture. You were able to find other uh, bones in this skeletal inventory of the fireplace. Yes. So we were able to um, search throughout, and we found other pieces of bone um, scattered around. Uh, do you know anything, or can you tell us anything about these pieces? So to your left, right? Yeah. Um, so you have pretty much kind of a group of uh, pieces of bone. These are too small for me to identify, but again, we can go back and say that they're bone, right? Because we have that spongy material and we also have that um, flat material that is consistent with compact bone. On the other side, um, that is actually the root of a tooth. Um, it's pretty much the shape uh, consistent with um, with a root. Sure. Uh, as well as the fire itself and the built fire, you looked at the fireplace grate. I did. Showing the jury what's been marked as 323, uh, just an overview of the grate, and 331, perhaps zoomed in a bit closer. Was there anything that started to cause you pause or suspicion as you looked at some of these photos or at, on scene? Yes, so I was able to look at um, the grate um, pretty much in situ, right? So they removed the grate from the initial, um, from the original location. Um, and I was able to look at it um, and I noticed that there was a human crown or a dental crown um, stuck to the grate. And are we looking at that right now? Yes. And if you can crank your head a little bit on the screen, <laughs> am I pointing to it with the laser right now? Yeah, that's, that's the one. Slightly uh, top right of center yes. for, for the court record. Um, you pulled that off at some point? We did. We Tell removed us what we're looking it. at. Yeah, yep. Sorry. 
And that's exactly what you're kind of looking. So you're looking again to that piece of bone that was consistent to be human, that is consistent with the cranial bone, and then the other one is the dental crown. Um, that is potentially a molar right on the back, so there's a lot of surface area there, um, but you can see the grooves, right, um, that are very, very unique, and those are very unique to humans. And so these were the two areas of, of what you believe to be unique to humans stuck to the grate? Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk about the ash trap a little bit. Um, there was a lot of work performed with the ash trap. Yes, there was a lot of work done. Okay. Um, I'm showing the jury what's been marked as exhibit number 334. They've seen this before and they've heard from uh, Mr. Boswell testified, who I'm sure you know. Um, uh, this was in the basement of the Halderson home? That is correct. Okay. And Mr. Boswell testified that he was unable to, to kind of fit himself in there, but were you able to kind of fit yourself in there and take a look at the ash trap for yourself? <laughs> yes, I was able to get in there. Okay. Um, what is it? Can you describe the general condition of it? So, um, so just so you, you guys can get a, a little bit of a, an idea. So we have those three different um, squares. So... Um, I was able to kind of fit in through um, that first one and then also the last one. Um, the reason for that is because I really wanted to see if there was bone in there, right? So that's pretty much the pit. So whatever was on the top can potentially be on the bottom as well. So, and I really want to see it without being undisturbed. So I tried to snuck in um, and try to fit in there. And you can see it's almost like a mountain, like a little mountain. And then at the top of it, you can kind of see, again, that brittle uh, bone-like material um, that had different colors, right? That white kind of residue, that black residue. Um, so it was, it was quite unique. And so I'm showing now uh, 337. Is that the inside? Yeah, that is the inside. So you can kind of see the, the little mountain. And is that on the, the right side of that photograph? Yes. Okay. Um, you're an anthropologist by trade, is, is ash or an ash trap kind of an ideal environment to perform an archeological dig uh, for, for bone or for fossils or for something of that sort? Um, it's not, it's very difficult. Um, if you wanna think about it in terms of just a regular archeological dig, um, you're, always, you're always digging in dirt. <laughs> so um, so it's, the consistency is there so you can actually move um, the dirt and you can kind of go by layers. Um, it's difficult, but it's definitely possible. Here, it was a little bit more tricky because A, of the confined environment, and second, um, the material itself, right? This is very loose, so we have to be very caref careful when we were ex pretty much removing everything. Do you believe it's possible that some material had sunk through as you were uh, removing some of the ash material? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, in general, um, we'll, we'll talk about what your findings were in a second, but you found a, a number of, of items that you believe to be bone in this ash trap, correct? Yes. Um, many, many items. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Uh, were the majority on top or were they in the middle or in the bottom or something else? How would you describe where kind of in this pile uh, you were able to, to remove those items from? So the major majority of the elements were actually in the top. So um, what we did is we actually separated and we try to keep it very consistent here. So we only had one person digging in this area so we can keep it again consistent. And then we try to do it by layers, pretty much like an archeological dig, right? So you go layer by layer because I really wanted to get a sense of how much was at the top, right? And then do we have anything at the bottom as well? Um, so we separated it by pretty much once the, everything was out, we sifted everything that was taken, and then once it was sifted, it was put in a box, and that box was given a number, right? One being at the top, and um, I think it was 12 or 13 being at the bottom, right? You have to remember this is super loose soil, so yes, at some point, I do believe that maybe some of those elements trickle down um, to another layer, but I think we were quite successful at um, getting as much material as possible um, without really disturbing um, the evidence. And so as the material was removed, um, it was sifted? Yes. And then the remains were put into 
Tupperware containers, essentially? Yep, pretty much. All right. Um, and you listed, in fact, in your report, as you went through it, there were 12 Tupperware containers of material, uh, of actual you know, fragments taken out. Um, and you listed per container uh, how much or which elements you found in which Tupperware container, correct? Yes. I wanted, again, I wanted to keep it consistent. Um, and um, especially with this being so such a difficult environment, I wanted to make sure that everything was labeled by container and then also um, make sure that those containers were associated with the level as, as best as we could. And uh, we don't have to go through every single one. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of them. Um, however, in your report, it's fair to say that box one, for instance, the top, um, your list took up the better part of three pages of, of identified material. Yeah, there was a lot of material in that first box. Box two, a couple pages itself. Yes. And then as we get to the end, there were numerous in, in Tupperware's 11 and 12 that had nothing in them. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the process. You have a little bit written here, but tell us about this slide and, and maybe what we're looking at with those Tupperwares. So pretty much, again, we go back. So um, we try to do, this is, if you want to categorize as an archaeological dig, um, it's, it's, it was pretty much exactly what it was, right? So we go out, we try to uh, dig through it. Um, again, we decided to just keep one person um, in that area so that it is consistent, plus it was too small for two people to be in there. Um, and then from there, it goes into a table. So we had several tables laid out um, outside, um, and we had multiple uh, law enforcement agents uh, sifting throughout. Some of them had a lot of experience doing this before. Um, so I was kind of jumping back and forth from table to table, right? And also kind of um, checking what, um, like what, um, what um, group or what uh, uh, was extracted from the original location and where it was uh, taken. And then from there, it was sifted. Everything that was found that was suspected to be human was put in these containers. And as you can see, it kind of looks a little bit rough, right? Because um, some of them do know what bone is and some of them you know, didn't think, well, I'm not 100% sure if this is bone, so I'm putting it in. So they put everything in there, right? We did not toss anything. Um, and then from there, we actually had 12 boxes um, with significant material. And you took that back to the medical examiner's office? I did. And there are more ideal conditions there for you to actually examine the bone? Yes. So what I do is I, I kind of do a second sifting. And this one, I actually do it by hand. Pretty much I sit in front of that box and I go element by element. And I try to clean them a little bit with just like a toothbrush. Um, and I try to determine if this is in fact bone or not. Sure. And we're just going to look at a couple different photographs. Here are varying uh, Tupperware. Some of them have little to no uh, items in there. Some of them have a lot. That is correct. And we'll just keep looking at them again, just different ones that were removed that day. And here we're getting maybe to the end where there's very little. Yeah, so that's the end. And we also um, research the fireplace and we research the fireplace grate just to make sure that we didn't mess anything. Okay. You go back to the medical examiner's office. Tell us what you do. We have some example photos here just to allow you to maybe describe what your process is. Sure. So um, what you're looking at is box one. So what I try to do is I sit down in front of my box and I go element by element. I have a toothbrush. I try to have some tools with me because, again, these are very fragile elements. So you do want to make sure that they don't crumble in your hand and that you can get as much information as possible. And then what I try to do is I laid out paper like you can see there and I label it box one of 12. And then I strike, I start categorizing them. So in this case, you can see at, almost at the bottom, you have cranial fragments, right? So I try to pretty much establish, okay, this is my first cranial fragment that I found in this box. So I usually label it as A. So that way, if I have to go back, I kind of remember pretty much what the inventory was. Um, so I go by cranial fragments, dentals or dentition, right? Any teeth, um, vertebrae, um, we found a potential long bone. Um, I found some hands and then also some small fragments that I cannot identify. So everything that you see that says small fragments, that's something that I know it's bone, but it's too small for me to say something about it. By their location, these bone fragments that were found in the ash trap, um, you strongly suspected, I, I believe, that they, they've been burned. Yes. Talk a bit about, if you could, the burning of bone and, and what that does to your analysis. And I think we have an example here that's not a bone involved in this case, but just an yes. example. Talk to me about this. So 
when, when, burn, when bone is burning, so you have to kind of go back a little bit to biology. So bone, again, has two major components. We have the organic material, which is you know, the blood, you know, the, I think about it almost like the good stuff, right? The DNA, everything that is inside that bone. And then I have the inorganic material. Inorganic material is salts, is minerals. Those are the ones that I go in the outside of the bone. Those are the ones that give the shape of the bone, right? So when it undergoes fire, the first thing that is gonna burn is the organic material, right? So that is why it is so difficult to get DNA out of burnt bone, right? Because that inside, that organic material, that good stuff actually burns quite quickly. So then the reason why you get still the shape of the bone is because you have that minerals. The minerals won't burn. So those is, that is the reason why you still have that shape of that bone, even though it undergoes fire, right? So the color of the bone is extremely important to me because it tells me the time, the duration, right? So if you remember the other images of the other bones, were kind of a yellowish, kind of brownish color. So that is unaltered bone, right? So that is bone that has not been um, through any type of damage. So then as the bone is exposed to the fire, you're gonna see that it's starting to get black, right? So obviously that organic material is starting to burn, but that inorganic material is still quite good. And as you can see, it's moving from brown, which we call charred bone, all the way to calcine bone. Calcine bone is white, so that white kind of grayish color. So that tells me A, that the all, all the organic material is gone, and B is telling me that the bone is quite fragmented, however, it has been in the fire for a very long time, right? So the color is giving me a lot of information about the duration of the fire. Talk to me about the color uh, of the bones you were able to find at the Halderson home. So here we have mostly um, white bone. Um, the dentals is a little bit of a black color, but the reason for that is because the dentals were actually embedded in, at some point, they were embedded in the mandible, right? So usually the mandible is the first one that burns, right? So as that burns, the teeth are protected. And then once they're exposed, they're usually exposed to the fire and you usually get that kind of black to grayish color, right? So I'm expecting that on the teeth. However, on the bone, you can kind of see that is all white, right? So we have the cranial fragments at the bottom and those are quite white. And then you have the vertebrae, which is just on top of the dentition. And those were asked, um, they're also quite white. Um, and you can kind of see, we do see that proximal distal end of a long bone that is kind of transitioning, right? You see that it's a little bit black and it kind of transitions into a white bone. So that also tells me that it was exposed to the fire for a long time. Okay. Um, we're going to look at the inventory, skeletal inventory, much like we did um, with Bart and Krista, their remains. Um, we're not going to look at every photograph, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It, there are too many. Okay. Um, but we have some examples here. And let's just, each one, let's just go left to right. So let's start with the left, which is the assortment of, of many. Um, and then we'll just go left to right. What is that left image? So these are pretty much just cranial bones. Um, they were too small for me to kind of pinpoint, okay, where they're located. Is it the front, the back? But I can tell you that some of them, uh, most of them were human and they were cranial bones, but they were too small for me to try to pinpoint exactly where they're located. What that center image? So that center image is actually, um, it, it was a very informative fragment. Um, do you remember those sutures, right, where the bones kind of meet? So if you kind of look at, take a peek at the top, you can kind of see that little, um, that little mark. Um, that is actually a cranial suture and is a well-defined cranial suture. Um, and this bone, um, if you flip it, um, you can kind of see again that layer, right? Remember that sandwich-like where you have that compact bone and then you have that spongy bone in the middle and then you have, so you can actually see the layers of that bone. Are those cranial sutures informative in any way as an anthropologist as to, to who this person was in terms of their gender or age or anything like that? Yeah, so, um, Again, looking at age, um, the, the cranial sutures are actually very informative to tell age, right? Because if you think about it, as your bones are pretty much growing and fusing, um, there is the documented information and documented um, 
um, data about how the sutures should look like uh, when you are um, a kid, a young adult, and then an adult. In this case, they're completely sutured, so that tells me that this was an adult. Okay, and what about the image on the right? So again, this is um, cranial bone. Um, the good thing about this one is that I was able to pinpoint that it's in this area over here. So kind of by your ear. So that area over there is very unique because there's a lot of sutures, right? There's a lot of bones that kind of meet in this area. And that tells me that it was pretty much one of, I can't tell you if it's left or right, but I can definitely tell you that it was in this area. Okay. Um, move to the next slide. Uh, you found a number of teeth in that ash trap, correct? I did. All right, so we're gonna look at some photographs. Just what are we looking at there? Um, so pretty much you're looking at, so all the ones in the blue, in the blue background, they are considered to be um, canines or um, central incisors or lateral incisors. Um, some of them might be premolars, kind of your, after your canines, um, but you can see well-defined roots in here. Um, and then on the black one, you can actually see um, it's a little bit bigger, right? A little bit wider, which could potentially indicate that is a molar, right? So the ones on the back. Now, sometimes when we hear on the news that, that someone like you is involved in a case, we'll hear that they're looking at dental records to identify human remains. What do people mean by that when they say they're looking at dental records? And what role does dental records have in identifying teeth uh, in human remains? Yeah, so in this case, um, when we're trying to identify someone with dentals, what we do is we go back to their medical records, right? So their dental records. And we get x-rays. We get pretty much their dental chart. Um, when you go to the dental and you get an x-ray, all of your teeth are in what we call in situ. So they are still embedded in your jaw, right? That is one of the unique features that uh, the odontologists and myself use for identification, right? Because the shape of that root is actually linked or associated with the mandible, right? So the mandible is the kind of the one that works with um, the tooth to create that shape, right? So that's what we tend to use. One of the one of the many characteristics that we use. When you have teeth that are just loose, that you don't have a mandible, it gets very tough. It gets very difficult to identify them because, first of all, you need to figure it out what tooth this is, right? So in this case, I'm missing a lot of the crowns. So I'm having a hard time saying, well, it looks like a central incisor, but it also looks like a lateral incisor. So that's where the challenges of identification come, right? Because we're missing the crown and we're also missing the mandible where those go. So the phrase identify someone by dental records means the position of their teeth, not so much the actual teeth. Yeah, that's one of the characteristics that we use. Got it. Next slide, we have some additional teeth. Yeah, so as you can see, these have a little, a, a little bit of a different color, so that's why I put a black background so that you guys can see it a little bit better. Um, you can see um, we have all the way to your left and all the way to your right. Um, those are potentially um, canines or um, premolars, but then the ones in the center are a little bit bigger, right? So those are the ones that go all the way in the back, the molars, right? When you're chewing, most of the, the food goes to the back, and those are the ones that are responsible for that. Um, so we were able to find an array of, of different types of, of teeth. And, and just because this is the last slide dealing with teeth, I'll ask the, the overall question. You were not able to identify whose teeth these were because of the condition they were in and, and, and how they were removed, essentially. That is correct. Okay. And did you consult with other experts in the field? We did. Okay. Um, what are we looking at there? So this is a vertebrae. Um, specifically, it is a... So the one on your... Um, left, that is a cervical vertebrae. I don't know if you remember those images at the beginning, right? So we have that, those little um, pieces of bone that kind of come out, and then you have that center bone. Um, so we're actually looking at one half of it. So you can see kind of the center bone in the middle, and then that little piece of bone, that flat piece of bone, that is supposed to attach to another vertebrae, right? And that is a cervical vertebrae. The reason for that is, um, I'm looking for several features again. The cervical vertebrae, they're very small, and they have several features that are telling me that this is cervical. None other vertebrae has those features. Um, and this one um, has the features of a cervical vertebrae. Um, the same with the other image. Um, again, you can see um, this is probably um, a first or a second. The reason for that is because of 
the curvature of that um, little piece of bone. Um, usually the ones at the top that hold your skull are very curved because they want to hold that weight. So that feature um, was very informative. And because it's a first or a second, you don't have, otherwise, you don't have either Bart or Krista's first or second vertebrae in any of the remains you examined, correct? That's correct. With Bart, you only had the fourth and below, and with Krista, you had none. That's correct. Okay. Um, and uh, what are we looking at here in the ash trap images? So this is just um, a summary of what I found for um, what I can categorize as hands. Um, so that little, um, to your left, that long piece of bone, that is actually um, part of your hand here. So it's one of these. The reason why I know it's a hand and not a foot is because it's very round, right? So the ones in your hand, those little pieces of bone, they're very round. The ones in your feet are actually quite wide. Um, again, you want to think about holding all that weight, right? Um, so so that one over there is just here, one of these. And then the two other ones are from your fingers. So actually, those are what we call distal phalanges. So these are the ones over here, pretty much at the top. Those are your fingertips? Yes. Uh, what is this image? So this is what I considered, I classified as long bones, because I was not 100% sure um, if it was left or right. So to your left, um, if you look at it kind of from an angle, that is actually the knee. So I don't know if you remember the femur, right, in those little um, kind of grooves where the knee goes. So this is actually one of the grooves of a femur. Um, and then on the other side, um, that is actually from a tibia. So the tibia, I don't know if you remember from those images, is actually very sharp. It has a very sharp end edge, um, and that is very unique of the tibia. There's no other bone that has that type of sharpness. Um, so we can definitely say that that is a tibia. I just can't tell you if it's a left or a right. Sure. That concludes, and we're, we have more slides, obviously, but that's the sample images you included. But just an overall question of the, the many bone fragments you found. Is it challenging, or are there additional complexities to determining what type of trauma that bone went through than if you just, for instance, with Krista, found remains outside, uh, laying outside uh, in a state park? What's, what's more complex about, it, about bones that have been burned? Yeah, so... You want to think about right what we talked about the organic and the inorganic right so organic material is completely gone so these are extremely fragile just because i have that inorganic material there right so those are the ones that give that a shape but as soon as you hold those sometimes they can crumble so that's why we needed to be very careful um obviously the fire is masking some of those potential traumatic elements that i cannot see Okay, and so let's talk about some of the trauma maybe that, that you, you tried to observe or did observe. Let's talk about this vertebrae, for instance. Yeah, so I know it's, it might be a little bit difficult for you guys to see that as a vertebrae, but that is actually, from the vertebrae itself, is those little pieces of bone that come out, right? Um, so this is one of them. Um, and then with my experience, right, and, and the way I know how that is supposed to look, um, that is, as you can see, there was a transverse, um, there was a transecting horizontally cut, right? Because that is supposed to be pretty much round, right? So those are the two um, transverse processes that are going on the side of the vertebrae, right? So we have the vertebrae in the middle and those two on the side. So it seems like one of them was actually cut uh, transversely. Sure. Uh, in a other than that, are there any conclusions you can draw from that? No, it, there was too much damage. I can tell you that there is a cut there. I cannot tell you anything else because of the thermal damage. Um, I use the arrows for you guys to kind of see what I'm talking about in terms of that straight cut. Sure. Let's talk about this vertebrae uh, on the next slide. So again, this is a fragmented uh, transverse process. So again, we're looking at the sides of, of the vertebrae itself. Um, and I know what it's supposed to look like, right? So it's kind of round and, and the, it has very round edges. Um, and on this one, you can kind of see. So those two images are from different planes so that you can actually appreciate the cut itself, right? So those arrows that you can see are, are indicating the cut. And then on the other image, you can kind of see the border of it that is, is, is almost, um, it is indicative of a cut mark. Okay. Let's talk about the hands. Um, talk to me about this slide. So this one was a very unique um, 
fragment of the lunate. So in your, um, in your wrist, you have multiple bones here that consist of your wrist. One of them is called lunate because it resembles the moon. Um, so I kind of put it up in, in that corner over there for you guys to kind of understand how it's supposed to look like. Um, so in this case, lunate was actually, it's supposed to be round, right? It's supposed to have all these shapes and you can kind of see that there is a cut um, on it, right? That, that is not supposed to look like that, right? So it is, and it's very clean, right? Um, even though undergoing thermal uh, damage, um, you can still see it. So um, yeah, you can see kind of the arrows over there where you can kind of see where that cut was made. Sure. But there were hand bones you were able to identify maybe more about the cut, right? In uh, terms of yeah. the next image. Oh, yes. Um, talk to me about this one. So this is actually a fragmented distal end of the radius. So you have your hand, right? You have these, you have your wrist where you have several, you know, little pieces of bone. And then you have your radius and you have your ulna. Um, so we're looking at almost like this little bump over here, right? So that's what consists made of your radius and your ulna. So what we're looking at is a little piece of bone that is supposed to be connecting with your wrist, right? Um, and in this case, you can actually see, because this is a bigger bone, um, obviously it preserved a little bit better. And you can kind of see the cuts. Again, it's supposed to be a long bone. It's supposed to have a lot of shape. It is not supposed to be flat. And you can kind of see on those arrows over there where that actual cut was made. And you say it's consistent uh, of a chop mark. Yes. So in this case, the bone was big enough for me to put it under the microscope. And you can kind of see it actually without the microscope. Um, so in this one, it was very unique because it had unpatterned striations. So if you go back to Krista and Bart, right, we saw a lot of striations that were uneven, right? They were all over the place. Um, and at times, it seems like it was very inconsistent. Um, those are those characteristics are consistent with a saw, right? But when we're looking at another type of tool, um, potentially a knife or something that it has a blade, um, we are looking for unpatterned striations. So we're looking at, we're thinking about the topography of the tool itself, right? So in this case, it was pretty much clean to the point that actually created striations, but there's no pattern to the striations, right? They're all the same, right? So you have to, so in our field, that is consistent to be with a chop mark. And if I go to the next slide, what are we looking at there? Yeah, so here you can kind of see it a little bit better. So on to your left, that is just an image, a photograph from, you know, taken with our camera. And you can kind of see on those arrows where those striations are. And if you can see, it's very different from the other ones that I show you. This one, we don't have a pattern. They're all pretty much the same, right? So that is usually related or correlated with um, like a blade. Um, and in this case, you can kind of see it also at the top as well. Um, and then the image to your right, that is actually a microscopic image. And you can kind of see a little bit more of, of the unpatterned striations throughout the entire bone. And we're talking about the wrist, correct? Yeah, pretty much at this area over here. And when you say chop marks, could that be consistent with a machete? It could. And could it be consistent with an ax? Yes. Okay. You reached some conclusions here. I did. Talk to me about those. So pretty much, as, as we all know by now, um, there was extreme fragmentation. Um, and this is due to the fire, right? The thermal injuries. Um, and they're mostly represented by that calcine bone, that white bone that, that I show you guys. And then we also have that charred black bone. Um, there is compelling evidence of dismemberment here. Um, even though we were not able to really pinpoint again, like we did for Bart and Krista, um, how, you know, what type of characteristics we can see because there was so much damage. Um, we can definitely say, um, with the suspected distal end of the radius, that there was unpatterned striations, right, consistent with chop marks. Um, three other fragments exhibited, you know, that transecting, you know, um, uh, cut marks, um, but because of the damage, I was not able to really give you more information about it. And I, I know you've been talking for a while, but this is my, I guess, last slide we're going to go through. Um, you put some of your conclusions about what you found um, 
in this slide. Tell me about this and, and those numbers that you, you, you came to include on the slide. Sure. So I just wanted um, to kind of give you a, an overall sense of what we found, right? So we found a total of 106 fragments of bone that were able to be identified. From those um, 106, 53 of them were considered to be on the cranium. When I'm saying cranium, I'm talking about skull and also mandible. And then we were able to identify 18 of them as hands, part of the hands, 20 of, 24 of them as dental fragments, and eight of them as vertebrae, and three of them as long bones. In addition to that, I had 124 fragments that I know they're bone, but I was unable to identify them. So we had a grand total of 230 bones, uh, fragmented bones that were found, um, again, inside the fireplace on the grate and also on the t ash disposal area. Nothing further. Cross-examination. Thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon now, I think. Starting sort of where we left off with okay. those um, bone fragments found at the home, I think I heard you say that you could identify whether they were human or not. Let's start there. That is correct. So some of the things you found, for whatever reason, you could not identify as human. Some you could identify as human. That is correct. Now, some of them you also were able to determine came from an adult human. Is that right? Some of the fragments did have features of an adult. Now, none of the fragments that you found could tell you whether it was a male or a female adult human, correct? That is correct. And despite the number of bone fragments you found, you weren't deter able to determine if they came from one human or six different humans, correct? That is correct. Now, turning back to your analysis um, from the beginning of your testimony, you were given a couple of um, tools to compare with the evidence that you found. Is that right? That is correct. Um, so the total number of tools you were given was two. Is that right? Yes. And you were able to say that what you found was consistent with those tools, but you couldn't say that those tools were the actual tools that caused those marks, correct? That is correct. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Any redirect? No. And uh, may this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.